All right, welcome back to ABA exam review. Today we are continuing our BCBA task list series with philosophical underpinnings A2, the philosophical assumptions of behavior analysis. The task list has selection as undeterminism, parsimony, and pragmatism listed. We will cover those four plus two more. As always, like, subscribe, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, let's get going. So A2, philosophical assumptions of behavior analysis. These are the shared assumptions about how our world works. These govern the world we live in, the world we practice in, and it's going to guide our behavior change procedures. We have to adhere to these assumptions. We're going to cover selectionism, determinism, parsimony, pragmatism, empiricism, and philosophical doubt. Question, which of the following answer choices is not a philosophical assumption of behavior analysis? All right, so we're looking for what is not an assumption. And on the exam, you have all these different kind of groupings, right? We have our dimensions, our assumptions, uh, what makes data good, um, what, what's our baseline logic, what are our goals of science, all these little groupings of terms that you kind of have to keep straight, right? So if asked a question like this, well, what is not a philosophical assumption? Well, you have to know what are our assumptions. Well, we know determinism, selection of and parsimony are, so we would obviously not choose those. The one we would choose is technological because technological is going to be a dimension, right? It's one of our dimensions of ABA. So let's start with selectionism. Selectionism, behaviors are kept or gotten rid of based on environmental factors. Now, this is what determines how do behaviors change in the future, right? If we look at phylogenic, phylogeny, selection happens over a long period of time due to evolution. So us as humans have evolved over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and we keep certain behaviors that have kept our species going, and we get rid of other behaviors. Animals do the same thing, right? Animals that survive tend to pick behaviors that help them survive longer and longer. So phylogenic happens over hundreds of years, right? A long, long period of time. Ontogenic is more what we work in. Okay, selection happens due to learning history with the environment. So if I deliver reinforcement, that learning history is going to lead to an increase in that behavior in the future. Same with extinction or punishment. So ontogenic is much more short, short term. It happens much more rapidly and happens much more often. Ontogenic is what we're going to primarily be dealing with as we go through our behavior change procedures. We're going to be working with the learning history of our clients. Now, cultural is very similar to ontogenic. Behaviors are selected and passed from one person to the next through imitation, modeling, or spoken word. What this is saying, what selectionism is saying, is behaviors are chosen based on environmental factors and the way they interact with the environment. So Madeline's father tells her to stop reading books and watch television instead. Madeline says she would rather read, so her father rips her book up. Madeline never reads in front of her father now. This represents what? Well, immediately, you should. This is a very common behavioral situation, right? Father says, Stop reading. Madeline says, I want to read. Father rips book up, punishes Madeline. Madeline never reads in front of father now, right? So, due to her learning history, okay, she's not going to read that book in front of her father. It's not an evolutionary trait that's evolved over hundreds of years, it's a direct result of her learning history. History. So this is going to be ontogenic. Determinism. Universe is lawful and orderly. Behavior happens for a reason. This one is extremely important for parent training. What do parents love to say? Parents love to say, well, they behavior happens out of nowhere, right? Behavior happens for no reason. I don't know why they do this. There's no reason for it. We know there is. The universe is lawful. It's orderly. Behavior is not random. Okay? Behavior happens, antecedents, and consequences. Antecedents evoke, consequences control those future occurrences, right? Mentalisms, okay, kind of go against determinism. Okay, These are our hypothetical constructs and fictions, right, that do not explain why behaviors occur. If you say, well, I failed that test because of my anxiety, that is an explanatory fiction, okay? That construct, right, of anxiety we're never going to blame your test failure on the anxiety, okay? 
there must have been something with an antecedent and consequence or in the environment that led to you failing that exam. We're going to look for observable measures, okay, and consequences we can change rather than these internal constructs. Determinism simply says universe is lawful, the universe is orderly, behavior happens for a reason. Again, super, super important when you're doing parent training to really drill this idea home and change the way we discuss behavior. Question, during a functional behavior assessment, you ask a parent if there are any behavioral concerns at this time. The parent says that sometimes a child will take their clothes off and run through the house for no reason whatsoever. The parent is violating what assumption? Again, happens constantly when you're a behavior analyst doing assessments. They just scream for no reason. They run through the house naked for no reason. We can't accept that, okay? So the parent is violating what assumption when they say this? Well, it's not selectionism, okay? We're going to talk about pragmatism and parsimony. What we're discussing here is determinism. When we say something happens for no reason, we're ignoring the fact that the universe is lawful and orderly. Parsimony. Consider the simplest explanation first. This is my favorite assumption, right? You need to get really good at thinking of simple explanations. When you work with clients or maybe you work with students or whoever you work with, okay, they tend, because they're not trained like you are, to go with more complex ideas, right? We have very complex explanations for behavior when a lot of times the simplest explanation is really the right one. You got to ask yourself, what logically makes the most sense? What would explain the occurrence in the least complicated way? And you start there. And if that doesn't explain it, then slowly move to the more complex. Don't hunt for complicated explanations or extraordinary analysis. You just keep it simple, okay? As you roll out simple explanations, get more and more complicated. You're just going to make things more difficult by trying to come up with very complex ways why this behavior might be occurring. Which of the following answer choices lacks parsimony? So if it lacks parsimony, what does that mean? Let's say we are lacking a simple explanation, right? We're going with something that really logically doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or it's very complicated. So A, the kids picked on Michael at school because he accidentally shaved his eyebrows off. It's a pretty simple explanation, okay? If Michael came home and said, kids picked on me, the first thing you would say is, well, you shaved your eyebrows off. That's very parsimonious. B, Blake did not respond to Amy's text because Blake moved away without telling Amy. Now, there's a lot of assumptions here, okay? And think of parsimony in terms of assumptions. The more assumptions you start making, okay, the less parsimonious you get. If we assume Blake moved away without telling Amy, it's a pretty big leap for not responding to his text. There's a million reasons to not respond to text. Moving away without telling them is a large leap in logic. C, Lane doesn't let his son use his kitchen knife because it is sharp. That's just common sense, about as simple as it gets. And then D, Alex acts up in class because his classmates laugh when he does. Again, why does he act in class? Well, he gets attention for it. Very parsimonious. B includes a lot of assumptions, a lot of leaps in logic. It really lacks that parsimony. We would want to go through several other options first about why she didn't respond to text and not just jump while he moved away without telling her. Pragmatism. Evaluate outcomes based on results and what will produce effective action. We want to be pragmatic. You need to be sensible, realistic, and individualized. Okay, so what works, what doesn't? We don't get married to treatments. We don't get married to interventions, no matter how hard you worked on it, no matter how much you like it, and no matter how effective it's been in the past. Each client is different, and we never, ever just use something because it's worked in the past or it's the easiest okay you have to ask yourself what's going to work for the client you have to be pragmatic use the data the data is going to guide you and help answer the question is it working is it not that's being pragmatic okay you put aside emotions feelings and you ask yourself is it working is it not that is being pragmatic Rachel spent hours analyzing and designing a treatment for self-injury for a client she works with in her clinic. After four days, the data indicates that the procedure is not working. What should Rachel do? Pretty demoralizing situation, right, when this happens. She's spent hours on this, okay? She spent hours, and then four days later, it's not working. 
So what does she do? What is her course of action here? Well, she wants to be pragmatic, so what must she do? A, continue using the procedure or else all that time will be wasted. Well, the time isn't wasted because we successfully ruled out something that's not going to work. B, refer to the client to another provider. No, if four days she rules it doesn't work, well, she has other things she can go with. So C, reassess and design a new intervention would be pragmatic. That treatment's not working. What do I do? Let me individualize, reassess, design a new intervention, try again. So to be pragmatic, it's not working. Let me start and try something else. C. Empiricism. Empiricism is extremely important, right? Empirical evidence. This is empirically validated. This is empirical research. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it just means an objective observation of events. Okay, we're relying on data-based observation and experience of behavioral events, not our opinions, not our subjective thoughts on what happened, not on just conversation about what happened, but data-based observation and experience, right? We're observing, okay? We're observing what's happening. You've got to be objective and you've got to quantify what you observe. And that's huge. That's where measurement comes in. If we're not quantifying what we observe, we're just shooting in the dark, okay? Good assessment always involves direct empirical observation. We never just want to go with an indirect observation and write a treatment plan. We need direct empirical observation, meaning we've observed it ourselves and we've quantified it ourselves. And our treatment is based on what we've observed and our experiences of those events. Question, which of the following descriptions provides the most empirical view of behavior? So if we want an empirical view, it's going to be objective, it's going to be quantified, right? And it's going to be direct. A, Johnny ran away several times yesterday. Several is not a good way to describe how often something happened. Several could mean three or more. Johnny ran away a million times yesterday. It's not clear what several means here. B, I think Sarah, I think Sarah texted me four or five times yesterday. Well, we're not going to go with I think when working with our behaviors. You don't write a treatment plan because you think it happens or you thought you saw it. Did you see it? Did you not? And then you quantify. See, it took you 20 minutes to get here after you left your house. This is objective. You measured exactly 20 minutes for you to get there. It's quantified. It's objective. D, the behavior happens occasionally when Jim is mad. It's very poor, okay? Mad is hard to observe. How do you quantify mad? Occasionally is not quantified. This is a very, very poor, right? And extremely lacking in empiricism. C is going to be our best answer here. It's quantified, objective. A is not quantified. B is closer. It's sort of quantified, but it's, I think, it's kind of wishy-washy. C is the best here, right? It's the most objective and it's the most quantified. Finally, philosophical doubt. This one's difficult, okay? Always question outcomes and results of studies and interventions, meaning you should be skeptical about your findings and the findings of others. So whatever your intervention shows, you should look at it and think, okay, the results were good. However, was there another reason for it? Is this, are, are the data real, okay? And then when others come with you to you and show you their findings, you need to look at it skeptically. Science can always be questioned and retested. That's what the beauty of science is. Somebody publishes a paper, people go out and try to replicate it. It's what we do. If I can't replicate it, okay, it's not good science. Ask, is there a better explanation? Can it be repeated? Was the result due to chance, conflicts of interest, or other outside means? Were the results skewed? Were they manipulated? Okay. Was the, did they change schools without telling you, right? Did they change breakfast routines without telling you? What else could have affected the intervention? You have to be skeptical. You have to question outcomes and results. Question, a good behavior analyst should exercise philosophical doubt in which of the following situations? A, you just completed a two-month intervention that decreased your client screaming 50%. Wow, amazing, amazing results, all right? You have to ask yourself, was it your intervention? 
Was it something else? Now, in practice, we are going to take that every time, but you can't just go around saying 100% it was my intervention that did, that did this, okay? We always have to think, what else could have caused this decrease? B, you attend a conference, and the hologram of B.F. Skinner presents his findings on verbal behavior. Wow, B.F. Skinner, a leader in our field, you know, the man who started it all, he's telling me something, I have to believe it 100%. Not true, okay? Even the most accomplished people you have to look at with a skeptical eye. That doesn't mean everything is wrong. You're not believing anything. You're believing it, but you know that it can be retested. It can be retried. It can be questioned. C, you read an article in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis on the effects of differential reinforcement on taking medication. Now, journal articles should always be looked at skeptically. Okay, The data, the methodology, the participants, everything. So a good behavior analyst should exercise philosophical doubt in which of the following situations. Well, D, all the above. Excellent. That was A2. We'll be back with the next part um, in a few days. So be on the lookout for that. Make sure you like and subscribe to get all of our video updates. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Let us know when you pass. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.